All right, let me invite you uh, to grab your Bible and join me in the book of Philippians. We are continuing our study of Philippians. We're in chapter 3, and this morning we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 11. Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. You know how Paul's writing is. It's hard to do more than three verses at a time. So that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. So as you turn there, let's pause, let's pray, and ask for uh, God's help. Father in heaven, author and inspirer of this, the book that we hold in our hands, we're asking for wisdom, we're asking for insight, we're asking for illumination. Lord, help us see, help us hear, help us understand. Give us a longing to know Christ better as a result of spending time in your word. Sanctify us through this time as we look forward to the day we'll spend all eternity in your presence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, reading from Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, Paul writes, And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. For those who have ears to hear, let them hear the truth of God's word. So I don't know about you, I enjoy movies. I enjoy going out to the movies. Um, It's one of the things I, I like to do with my wife and we enjoy going out some from time to time. But there, I will say there's a common storyline that's happening, and it seems like a lot of movies anymore, or a trope, that I'm over. Like, I'm really tired of it. Uh, and that is any story that has to do with alternative timelines. Do you know what I mean by that? Um, I'm talking about when basically any time time travel is involved. Like, I, I, I'm really sick of it. Uh, so I, I, I was Googling, which is dangerous, I know, but I, I was uh, Googling for an explanation of alternate timelines for you all. And this is uh, one resource came back with this. It says, the concept of alternate timelines arises from the notion that time travel could potentially create branching realities, each with its own set of events and outcomes. And this theory, Now, just reading that hurt my head. Okay, it did. Time travel never makes sense in movies. It just, it just doesn't. And anytime people try to make sense of time travel and, it, and its effects, it just creates more and more holes and more and more confusion. And so I think the movie that handled time travel the absolute best is Napoleon Dynamite. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go ahead and rent that, okay? And thank me later. Um, <laughs> anyhow, yeah. So uh, anyhow, I don't like time travel. I don't like alternate timelines. And yet today, we are going to be talking about our own altered timelines as Christians. Did you know we have timelines? And if you're a Christian, your timeline has been dramatically altered by Jesus, And it has nothing to do with time travel. It has to do with our own past, present, and future. Okay? And so we're picking up in Philippians. And last week we saw how Paul was just listing off all of his reasons he could have confidence in the flesh. All the reasons why he could, if you were going to be justified by your own good works, Paul had the, the resume for it, right? He had the Jewish resume to end all Jewish resumes. And yet, after he listed off all of his achievements, all of who he was, he says, compared to knowing Jesus, it's excrement, right? Compared to knowing Jesus, it's rubbish. Now, Paul is going to explain in our text what it means to truly know Jesus, okay? And that's what we're going to be looking at this week. Last week, I emphasized to you that one thing that sets our faith apart as Christians is from every other religion 
is that we are not primarily pushing a set of dogmas or doctrines. Now, we have dogmas and doctrines, and we do love them, okay? But what sets Christianity apart as a religion is that it's centered on a person and encountering a person, not encountering a set of teachings or dogmas, but encountering a person who's alive right now, the right hand of the Father, right? And so at its core, our faith is knowing a person. And it's interesting this morning is we're going to talk about three doctrines, right? But the three doctrines are birthed out of knowing Jesus. And they're absolutely crucial for our faith. And so our text this morning reveals that knowing Jesus transforms the entire timeline of our lives. And we are going to study how knowing Jesus changes the three phases of our lives. So the first phase that Jesus changes when you know him is he changes our past. He changes our past, and he does this through full justification. Full justification. So Paul had just used the strongest of language and terms to show that the key to being righteous in God's eyes is not our obedience to the law. It's not. He realized after he met Jesus that his prior life of obedience was worthless, okay? He said every good work, every act of righteousness is worthless compared to knowing Jesus. So let's look at verse 9. And he says, And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And so Paul says he's willing to put all of his good works in the garbage dump, right? Just so long as he could know Jesus. And he says he wants to be found in Jesus. Now, what does that mean? What's it mean to be found in Jesus? This is talking about when you trusted in Jesus, if you're a Christian here today, when you trusted in Jesus, you are united to Jesus spiritually, okay? And that has massive ramifications for our life and for our faith. And one major ramification are justified. So what is justification, okay? Justification is one of the most important doctrines we have in, as a church in the Bible. Justification is a legal term. Now, I don't know, have you ever heard it explained this way, that justification is like, it's just as if I'd never sinned? You ever hear that? That's good, but it's incomplete, okay? Because it is just as if you'd never sinned, but it's also just as if you've always obeyed, okay? It's both, just as if you'd never sinned, just as if you've always obeyed. And so, To be justified is to be declared righteous in God's eyes as God is the judge of the entire universe. And so to be justified in the sight of a holy, pure, and righteous God. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine a holy, pure, and righteous God looking at you, peering into your soul, and saying you're righteous? Now, if you're honest with yourself, you know that's not true. Are you righteous in yourself? In your own flesh, you know that you are far from righteous, that from birth you've been born in sin, and and that even if we worked really, really hard to try to be righteous like Paul, Paul says we can't, because God's standard of righteousness is what? It's perfection. It's perfection. So even if you spent, let's be really generous here, 99% of your life being good, 99% of your life obeying God. 99% of your life doing the right thing all the time. And even if you failed at just one point, you know what that means? You're not righteous. Okay? Because you can't be a little righteous, or you can't be kind of righteous, or you can't be mostly righteous. It's like wet. You're either wet or you're not wet. Right? Either you're righteous or you're not righteous. And so in order for us to pass God's judgment, 
the standard is perfection. You need to be perfectly righteous. And when you realize God's standard of righteousness is perfection, there should be two realizations that smack you in the face. Okay? The first one, well, if that's true, I have zero chance to save myself. Because I already blew it. Right? We already messed up. Congratulations, it's over. Right? Zero chance to save yourself. The second realization that needs to smack you in the face, if you're ever going to be declared righteous in God's eyes, your only hope is to be clothed with somebody else's righteousness. Your only hope is to receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's what Paul is saying here in verse 9. Of his own that comes from the law. So, so Paul doesn't want his own DIY righteousness, right? That he, he manufactured himself through obedience because he knew it's truly impossible to obey God's law perfectly. What is God's law? We could sum it up in two commandments, right? What's the, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Anybody do that? Anybody do that today? Anybody do that this hour? What's the second commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. We fall far short from obeying these commandments. We need to understand that. So we cannot save ourselves through obeying the law. But notice what Paul talks about. There's a second kind of righteousness in verse 9. He doesn't want his own kind of DIY righteousness that comes from the law. Instead, he wants a righteousness that comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. So verse 9, notice this. There's two different kinds of righteousness that Paul talks about. There's a righteousness that comes from the law, and there's a righteousness that comes from God. All right, do you see it? You need to see that these two kinds of righteousness are mutually exclusive. Okay, they're mutually exclusive. You can't have them both. It's one or the other. Either you'll have your own righteousness through your own efforts, or you'll have God's righteousness. Which one do you want? Which one do you need? We need God's righteousness. All humans desperately need God's righteousness. So here's the big question. Hopefully you know this. Maybe you don't. How do we attain God's righteousness? Like, how do we, we are here, God's righteousness is out here. How do we take it? How, how is it appropriated to us? Well, what does Paul say? God's righteousness is a righteousness that comes how? Through faith. Not just through faith, but through faith in Christ. Through faith in Jesus, the Son of God. Faith is the means by which we grab hold of God's righteousness. Okay? We have to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is the instrument that we use to grab hold of the righteousness of God. Faith, by the way, is not a good work in itself. Otherwise, we'd have a reason to boast. Faith is a gift. We just saw that in Philippians 1.29, right? And so faith is a gift from God. It's how we believe, when we believe in Jesus, it's how we are counted to be as righteous. And we also have to know, I need to remind you, maybe I've already said this, but you're not saved by the quality of your faith. Did you know that? You're not saved by the quality of your faith. You're saved by the object of your faith. And so you could have a ton of strong faith in an unworthy object, and what's going to happen? It doesn't matter how much you believe in the object. It, it, if the object's unworthy, it will let you down. So imagine, I, I guess we could have done this as a, an example, but imagine there's an old rickety chair up here. Okay, and when I say old and rickety, I mean it's just barely hanging on for life, right? It's barely hanging on, like the kind of chair that if you breathe on it, it might fall, right? You're all picturing me this kind of chair? Okay, it does not matter how much faith I have in that chair to hold me up. I, I could harness all the powers of positive thinking that I could uh, muster up, right? All the mental belief that I'm going to sit on this chair and it's going to hold me up and I could do my best to really, really, really believe. And I believe it all the way. And guess what? Ultimately, it doesn't matter. 
It doesn't matter how much I believe an old chair is going to hold me up. If it is an unworthy object of my faith, the moment I sit on that chair, what's going to happen? It'll shatter and I'm going to be on the ground, right? If the object is unworthy, your faith is futile. That, you need to understand, you're not saved by the quality of your faith. You're saved by the object of your faith. That's why if you have even the smallest amount, the tiniest amount of true faith, maybe even say a mustard seed amount of true faith in the bright object, you can be saved. And the Bible tells us the place that all, our faith must be placed is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died for our sins, who rose from the dead. And even the smallest amount of true, genuine faith in the worthy object of Jesus will save your soul for eternity. You hear what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying he's given up his own self-salvation project. That's what he's saying. He's given up his own efforts to become righteous by keeping the law. Now instead, he's looking outside of himself for a righteousness that only God the righteous judge can give to him a righteousness that comes only by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus' sinless life mattered here on earth. You know, Jesus was the only person who lived on this earth who never sinned. Do you know why that's so important? Because he gives to us, when you trust in him, he gives to us his righteousness. It's imputed to us. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we become the righteousness of God. All right, so Jesus' righteousness is given to us. Martin Luther called it the great exchange. He takes our sins, he gives to us his righteousness. So I started this off, I said, well, this affects our past, okay? And it affects our past in an amazing way. If you place your faith in Jesus... If you trust that he died for your sins, you are justified. You are righteous in God's eyes. You know what that means for all of your past sins and all your present sins and all your future sins too? They're all forgiven. All of your sins are forgiven. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how badly you've messed up. If you turn from your sins and repentance and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, all of your sins are forgiven. Now, you might be thinking, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. I've been bad, right? You you don't know. That's true. I don't know what you've done. Yeah, you don't know what I've done, right? Ultimately, God knows. God knows. And we're told that if we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, that God will give the righteousness of Jesus to us and counts us as righteous in his place. Again, the reformer and Martin Luther says, the devil tells me I'm a sinner. I reply, tell me something new. I know that, but my sins are no longer mine. They belong to Christ. Go read Luther. Luther uh, has these conversations with the devil a lot, right? He felt condemned a lot. And because we trust in Jesus, we're united by him, to, united to him by faith. He takes on all of our sins. He gives to us all his righteousness. And when God, the eternal, perfect, pure, holy, awesome, great God looks at you and peers into your soul, he says, righteous, with the righteousness of my son. That's justification. That changes all your past. That changes all your past. Now, this takes us to the second phase of life that changes from knowing Jesus. Not only does our past change, but our present changes through ongoing sanctification. So we talked about justification in verse 9. Verse 10 is all about sanctification. Justification is a one-time act. It's a one-time event when you trust in Jesus by faith. You don't need to keep being justified. Okay? Once you're justified by faith, you're justified. All right? Sanctification is a little different. Sanctification is an ongoing process where believers are being made holy. Okay? We're being progressively sanctified or set apart by the work of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit takes the Word of God and presses it upon our hearts. But I, I love how Paul 
describe sanctification in verse 10? Because maybe you read verse 10, you're not really thinking sanctification. But that's what it is. Look at verse 10. Paul says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. So sanctification is all about becoming more like Jesus, okay? But notice how Paul voices it. He says, he has this clear longing, doesn't he? A longing to know Jesus better. Now, did Paul know Jesus? He did. In fact, did you know at this point, Paul would have known Jesus close to 30 years, okay? Close to 30 years. So what, Paul, what is Paul saying here? He's saying that he's not satisfied with how much and how well he knows Jesus. He's not satisfied. He wants to know Jesus better and better. You see, you cannot ever in this life get to know Jesus well enough. You, you can't. You can never plumb the depths of the riches of knowing Jesus. Okay? You remember how John finishes his gospel in John 21, 25? John writes, now there are also many other things that Jesus did Were every one of them to be written, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. You hear what John's saying? He's like, guys, I did my best, but we can't even fill up this globe with the amount of, 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 of material we could write about Jesus and what he has done. And so we all need to understand that one of the goals of your faith as a Christian should be always growing in the knowledge of Jesus. Okay, and not just knowing things about him, but knowing him relationally as well. And so if you're not actively pursuing Jesus, trying to know him more and more, you're missing the entire essence of the Christian life. You're missing it, right? If you think you know Jesus well enough, then you don't need to spend continuous energy on knowing him better. Let me just humbly ask or suggest, you might not know him at all. If you're bored with him, or the idea of, of seeking Jesus and learning more about him, you don't know him because Jesus is not boring. He's not. And so if you love Jesus, you will make it your life's business to know him more and more because the riches are bottomless. Okay? But notice Paul's words. He wants to know Jesus more and more, but then he adds what? And the power of his resurrection. What is the power of his resurrection? Well, Jesus died on the cross. He rose again from the dead. The power of Christ's resurrection is divine power. It's the power of God. And if you would read Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, you'll read that that same power, resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in us who believe. Did you know that? That same power that raised Jesus from the dead is making us holy. It's making us fit for Christ to dwell in us, Ephesians 3.17. That same divine power that raised Christ from the dead is working in us to help us grasp the magnitude of the love of Jesus. That's what Paul says in Ephesians 3. And so that divine power is at work sanctifying us. It's helping to enlarge our hearts for who Jesus is, growing in our faith. And so if you know and love Jesus today, it's because you've gotten a taste of that resurrection power. Because you were dead in your sins and trespasses. If, you are, oh, if your eyes are opened, if you know who Jesus is and you love him today, that the same power that raised Christ from the dead has changed out your hearts and you've given you new hearts. Okay? You've gotten a taste of of God's working in you that you can't explain. And that's why your desires have changed. And that's why you've seen your priorities change. And that's why you, while you still mess up and sin, sin is unsatisfying to you now since Christ is alive in your heart, in your life, right? And Paul wants to grow as a believer and he has that same longing that same power that raised Jesus from the dead to continually change him and form him into the person that God wants him to be. This is sanctification. This is God making us holy. We strive, we battle, but we also recognize it's divine power that's necessary if it's going to happen. 
So I, I like to say sanctification is a synergistic work, right? It's God working and us working together where God makes us holy. Notice what else Paul says in verse 10. He says that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And I'm, I'm guessing here, those first two parts of, of the sanctification we're on board with, okay? Yes, I want to know Jesus more. Yeah, sign me up for resurrection power. That sounds awesome, right? I, I want more of that. How about this last part? Sharing in his sufferings and becoming like him in death. You want to sign up? That doesn't sound so appealing, right? What is Paul talking about here? The word sharing is koinonia. It's a word we often translate fellowship, right? The, the fellowship of his sufferings. And this goes back to our union with Christ. We talked about how we share in Jesus' righteousness. We share in his resurrection. Both of those are true. Both are amazing. We need to also see that we share in his sufferings and share in his death. Now, in one sense, Jesus' suffering and death on the cross is unrepeatable. He, he paid the full price. It is finished. We do not add to that. We cannot add to it. We cannot redeem anybody. We cannot atone for our own sins. Not at all. That's not what Paul's saying. Jesus suffered alone and he bled and died alone on the cross. But spiritually, when you trust in Jesus Christ, you are united to him in his sufferings and in his death. Is that not what we picture in the drama of baptism whenever we do baptisms? What's the picture? You know, we have people getting dunked in the water. Is it, what's the meaning behind being dunked? The person going under the water is saying they're identifying with Jesus in his death, burial, and his resurrection, right? That they've died to their sins with Christ. They've been raised with Christ to new life. That's what we're showing. And so suffering, we see it over and over again in the Bible, should not be a foreign concept for Christians. We worship a Savior who suffered. We follow a Savior who suffered a lot actually. And nobody likes suffering. We don't even like talking about suffering. Yet here Paul is saying he wants to share in the sufferings of Jesus. So is Paul just like a glutton for punishment? Right? Some, some have called, is he a spiritual masochist? Right? Of course not. Uh, why does he want to share in the sufferings of Jesus? Listen to what D.A. Carson writes. Carson writes, Paul does not want to suffer simply because he likes to suffer as if suffering gives him some kind of perverted joy. Rather, Paul understands that the master was a man of sorrows and familiar with sufferings. And he feels that following him in this way is part of knowing that master. We will never be called to suffer to any degree that Jesus had suffered. Okay, But it is through suffering that we can know Jesus better. It is through suffering that we can grow in our understanding of who he is and what he's done for us. And, and I know some brothers and sisters who have suffered a lot in this life. And you do too. And I can tell you that I've often seen, through the event of their suffering, many dear saints grow more and more to be like Jesus. Amen? Have, have you witnessed that? Have you witnessed somebody having to go through all kinds of suffering and it was through the course of that suffering that they became more Christ-like? I might dare say they, they grew to be more like Jesus in a way that might not have been possible if they didn't suffer. And so Paul longs to share that suffering with Jesus. And he understands that he can grow in holiness and sanctification through that identification with Christ's suffering. And so here, here's my encouragement to us this morning. My encouragement is not, guys, go out looking for suffering so you can be super holy. Right? Just like jump in front of buses, do whatever you need to do. Right? Like you want to suffer to be extra holy. Uh, that's not the application here. Okay? Here's what I would encourage you with because you don't need to look for suffering. It comes for you. Okay? My encouragement is, if you are called to endure trials, if you are called to endure suffering in your life, don't waste it. Don't waste it. Use it to seek the Lord. Use it to find comfort 
in God's presence. Draw near to your Savior who knows what it means to suffer. You see, we don't run to a God who has no idea what life is like on this earth. We run to a high priest who is tempted in every way we are tempted, yet was without sin. A, a high priest who suffered, a high priest who cries out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A high priest who knows what it looks like to feel pain and anguish and forsakenness. When you're feeling that, lean into him. Seek him. Let it drive you to deeper trust, deeper prayer. Cry out to Christ as your high priest. Die to yourself. Pick up your cross. Follow after him until, until he calls you home. And so if you are a Christian, if you have trusted in Jesus currently, you are in the process somewhere of being sanctified, right? Day by day, bit by bit, God is conforming you to the likeness of Jesus. You are being sanctified. This is how presently God is changing us. Well, we're going on to the third phase of life that changes when we know Jesus. And thankfully, that's our future. And we're talking about our future through anticipated glorification. Our future through anticipated glorification. So Jesus changes our past. He changes our present. Verse 11, he addresses our future. That Paul says that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So here, here's the end goal. The end goal is resurrection from the dead. Now we're going to talk about the implications of that future resurrection in a moment. But first, let's talk about the, the first part of Paul's words there. His phrase where he says that by any means possible, I may attain. So some have questioned what seems to be almost a lack of assurance or certainty from Paul here, right? Did Paul doubt that one day he was going to be resurrected from the dead? Was he not certain that that was going to happen? Did he lack assurance of his faith? We see in a couple places in Paul's writings where he has, or at least voices, some healthy self-distrust, okay? Which I would argue is a good thing for all of us, Okay? And while Paul wants believers to have assurance and confidence in Christ, he also does not want us to be presumptuous, okay? And so Moises Silva quotes Calvin about this. He says, Calvin is quite correct that Paul wants to impress upon us the difficulty, struggles, and hindrances that attend the believer's life. The apostle would remind us that even he must watch and pray continually to abide in the fellowship of Christ's suffering for only in that way, the glorification with Christ will be attained. And with God's true people, we know we'll persevere in the faith. We just saw earlier in this letter, Philippians 1, 6, what does it say? Paul says, I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus, right? But Jesus warned, there are going to be some people who start off strong in the faith, but their confession of faith is not genuine. Okay, and Jesus said there's some circumstances that are going to enter their lives after they confess to believe in him that's going to choke that out. And those circumstances include suffering, the cares of this world, and the desire for riches. And those things will reveal their faith is not genuine. And so as far as Paul was concerned for himself, he did not want to take anything for granted. Okay, as far as it was up to him, he was striving to live in faithfulness to Jesus. And that's exactly what Peter writes about in 2 Peter chapter 1. Now, I'm going to paraphrase his arguments here. But in, in, you can read this later. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter begins by talking about how Christians, through God's power, have been given everything necessary for life and godliness. Right? And he says that God has make us, made us partakers of the divine nature. And then you know what he writes next? He says, and so and he starts saying, now you need to start stacking virtues, right, in your life. You need to start adding steadfastness, and, and you need to start adding perseverance, and, and you need to start adding uh, all these good virtues in your life. Why? Is it because he's saying you need to earn your salvation? No, Peter says you need to do this to show yourselves diligent to confirm your calling and your election. 
you should strive with all of your energy to be righteous, to follow Jesus as best as you can, to confirm your calling and your election, to show that your faith is real, that it's legit, that it's not fake. And so Peter's not saying we're saved by virtues of our own. He's saying that's how we show that we genuinely are saved. And that's what Paul is getting at here. He's hoping to confirm his calling and his election. Why? So that he may attain the resurrection from the dead. So what's so great about resurrection from the dead? Have you ever stopped to think about that? We talk about it a lot. What's so great about it? What's so great being risen from the dead? That's our future glorification. Our bodies are going to be risen from the dead. That's what we have to look forward to. Why is that so great? Well, let's just think about it. Can you imagine waking up in the morning and not being sore? Sound good? Can you imagine not getting sick? Can you imagine not having to need surgery? Can you imagine not feeling pain? Can you imagine not feeling anxious? Can you imagine not needing any more treatments? Can you imagine not needing medicine? Not needing anything because our bodies are going to be perfect as they were originally meant to be. Does that sound good to you? That's the resurrection from the dead. But we're talking about more than just getting new bodies, as great as that is. Silver writes, the resurrection represents perfection at every level of his existence. So it is mentioned here as the culmination of his spiritual pilgrimage. But even, even that we can't stop because that new body, that, that perfect body, that resurrection body, as amazing as it's going to be, is not the greatest blessing of eternal life. What's the greatest blessing of eternal life? You know what it is? We're going to spend eternity living in the presence of God. The greatest promise of the future that we have is we're going to live in the presence of our Lord and Savior forever. And so I thought, well, how can I really hammer this home to everybody here? I thought, you know what? My words are going to fail miserably. Let's turn there together. Let's turn together to Revelation. Revelation chapter 21. Okay? Flip over. And we'll close after this. Revelation chapter 21. Let's look at first verses 1 through 4. We're going to look at a few verses here. Revelation chapter 21. Meditate on what we're going to read here. Drink these words in deeply. The Apostle John says in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Stay there. Jump down to verse 22. John says, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Flip over to chapter 22, verses 3 through 5. John says, No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. That is what Paul is looking forward to. That is what everyone who's placing their trust in Jesus Christ are looking forward to. That's what we have as our future in Him. Our future is us living in resurrected bodies on a resurrected earth with our resurrected Savior forever. The truth is that if you've come to know Jesus, He's radically changed your past, your present, and your future. He justifies you, sanctifies you, and glorifies you. 
right? There's no other person. There's no other person who can do that, right? No other religion can do that, can accomplish that. Only the Son of God can completely alter the timeline of your life. Only knowing Jesus can give you assurance about your past, give you confidence in the presence, and give you true hope for the future. The, the, the only question that this passage is begging me to ask you is, do you know Jesus? Because that's how this is all possible. It's only through knowing Jesus by faith. The Son of God who died for your sins, who rose from the dead. Do you know him? And let me just say, if you don't know him, you can know him by trusting in him today and crying out to him in faith today and seeking forgiveness of your sins today. And if you do know him, maybe, maybe you're like Paul. Maybe you're like, yeah, I know Jesus. I've known him for 30 years. Are you still desiring today more than any other day to continue to know him better and better? If you don't have that desire, something broken in your sanctification process, okay? The way you're going to grow in holiness is not through pure, white-knuckling observance of God's law. The way you're going to grow in holiness is by knowing Jesus better and better, okay? And he'll change, the, he'll change your life, and, and you'll have those desires for righteousness, and you'll seek obedience and all those things. But it comes from this heart desire to know the Son of God as your Lord, as your Savior. Nothing else can replace it. Because only in Christ can we be justified. And only in Christ can we be sanctified. And only in Christ, that future we read about, is that future possible? It's only through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father God, it's our prayer, my prayer for everybody here that we would know Jesus and know him better and better for every day you've given us and will give us on this earth. May we use it in service of trying to know Jesus better and better so that we can know him in the power of his resurrection and a share in his sufferings and in his death so that, Lord, we can look forward to one day gaining the resurrection uh, unto eternal life through him. Father God, I pray that, that you would stir our souls to know our Savior better. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We rejoice to celebrate the Lord's Supper together here this morning.